So we just got back. It's a Saturday morning at like 5.30 in the morning and spent a week on the Carnival Breeze. Now I put the Canon M50 through its pace of this week, used it in all sorts of situations with all sorts of different lenses. Um, we were on beaches, inside the ship at night, in shows, um, flash situations, taking portraits of uh, some of my friends, long exposures at night and in the morning. So I really use this camera like I would my DSLR. And when I get home, I'm gonna go through all the images and we'll see how it did. I know there's some situations where I couldn't really do what I wanted to do. And I still haven't figured out the metering modes in this camera. It's not as easy to use as my DSLR, but for the most part, it was great having a small, very maneuverable camera that really did everything I needed it to do. Okay, so long drive home, two days in the car, but we'll look at the images when I get back. Okay, so I'm back home and I am excited to make this video because I just spent an entire week with the M50 and about four lenses. Um, the first thing I wanted to say is the camera performed perfectly. I had no issues with it. It mechanically worked great. Um, I was able to get most of the shots that I wanted. It was reliable and uh, it was just a great camera to have for the whole week. Is it different than a DSLR? Absolutely. It's smaller. It doesn't have the dynamic range of a DSLR. Uh, the focusing is just as good, maybe better actually than my D750, but it's smaller, lighter, and much easier to take with you when you're traveling. And one of the things that I always was nervous about going into foreign countries or traveling anywhere with my DSLR and, you know, bigger lenses is you're a little bit of a target. So you, you look like a tourist. People know that gear is expensive, so you got to be careful with your stuff. You can't leave it anywhere. I was walking around with the M50 with the 22 millimeter lens on it in Puerto Rico. And I mean, literally it was the size of my hand. It looked like a point and shoot. So I could get really great images. And as I go through this video, I'm gonna be dropping the images in. I'm gonna talk about specific things, but I may just throw images in as we go. I took probably close to a thousand images. I've edited a couple hundred, maybe. It's you know been a lot of editing over the last day or two. But I wanted to give you a good sampling of what you can do with this camera and then talk about some of the limitations and I'm gonna start at the beginning. So when I first got to Florida, we drove down for two days. The night when we were driving in, there was a beautiful sunset. So we were staying at a hotel that was right by the pier in Cape Canaveral, Florida. So in the morning, I got up and went to the beach that was right there, and I was able to get these images of the sunrise. Now, the sun coming up was beautiful. It was super vibrant. And the camera was able to capture all of that. And in some of these images, I'm going to show you how I was able to manipulate the images afterwards because some of the images were dark and I had to compensate for the sky. But the dynamic range in the camera was pretty good. Now, I was using the Tokina, a um, 11 to 16 lens here. And having worked with my Nikon 16 to 35, it's a similar focal length. But I'll tell you right now, though, the Tokina is not as sharp as the Nikon. And what I've learned over the course of this whole week is better glass is going to give you better results. And I've always thought that, and I figured, you know, I could get as close as I could with the less expensive glass that I bought for this camera. And the results are passable, but there's definitely a difference. So if the camera is not the issue, this is a great little camera. If you put really good lenses on it, you could have this camera for years and years. It's a great little camera. So here are some of the images I took from the morning I was walking around on a little pier here and there was the, the beach. It was a beautiful morning. And then we got on the ship. There's always that warm up time when you're shooting with the camera. And I was going through the same thing. I was just taking pictures of friends, family, the, the ship itself. And um, that's a great time to get a feel for the camera, start to see how it works what you can do, what you can't do with it. And one of the things that I learned about this camera is the metering modes are different than a DSLR. So in my Nikon, when I want to meter on something, and that means the camera will meter the scene by evaluating the light coming in and trying to balance out the whole scene. But you have the controls inside the camera to tell the camera what you want it to do. And if you look back at my metering video, you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. I have my DSLR set up so that I can spot meter. So that means if somebody is really backlit and their face is dark and in the shadows, I can meter off of their face and it'll totally blow out the background, but it'll properly expose their face. 
With the Canon M50, I was having a really hard time with this because the camera meters off the center. So there's a circle inside the viewfinder and that's what the camera meters off of. So if I'm focusing over here on somebody's face, it's still metering off this. So I found myself having to manipulate the camera and move it slightly as the metering would adjust my exposure. Now, I don't know if there's something about it I couldn't figure out or there's a setting I don't know, but I looked everywhere and I couldn't figure it out and I had no connections to look it up online. So I definitely had some issues with the metering. Nothing major, nothing that you couldn't work around. And if you've never used metering before, you probably wouldn't even notice. But for me, this was something that I'm going to have to get used to with this camera and I prefer my DSLR. So one of the things I like to do is put an ND filter on my camera and put a lens that opens up really wide and use it in the daylight. And the reason I can do this is I have a variable ND filter that I screw onto the front of my lens. I use the 50 millimeter 1.8 on here, which is a very inexpensive lens. It was $125. So I, I do this a lot and I, I like to go in water in with the camera and get low close to the water line and put a flash on the camera. I put a speed light on it. And I love to take these type of pictures because it's, a, it's an odd different type of look to put a flash on a camera, be this close to water with such a shallow depth of field. And this is something I've always done with my DSLR. And I was able to do this without any problem. The only issue I had is because it's a very small ND filter and I didn't buy an expensive one, it, I didn't get the sharpest images. So if you, like I typically would use, like I, last year I did it on my um, Sigma uh, art lens and I had a B&W you know, ND filter on it, which is a $150 ND filter. And the images were tack sharp. This muddled the images a little bit. They weren't super, super sharp. So in the future, I would just spend that more money on a better ND filter and maybe not a variable. There's two glass elements in there and you kind of turn them against each other. So I think the more light has to travel through this glass and if it's not good glass, it makes, um, it degrades the image quality. But the uh, $125 1.8 lens was great. and you know, these shots are interesting and they're fun shots. So the camera performed really well here. We stopped at this place called Amber Cove. It's in the Dominican Republic. And it's a, it's like a giant pool complex. Very, the ships are right there and it has some elevation. There's kind of a hill up the back where they have water slides and a little zip line. So I went up there with the camera and I was trying for 15 minutes to figure out how to use the built-in time-lapse mode. And I couldn't figure it out, but I stumbled upon this little miniature um, time-lapse setting. So I took a shot of the entire area with this and I'm going to let it run here. It puts a tilt shift effect onto the camera where it blurs the top and bottom. So you have a strip of focus going from left to right and it gives you this weird cool effect. So I was messing around with that. So the camera has some really cool fun stuff built into it. And I'm sure the time-lapse mode was in there because I've used it before. I just couldn't find it. And like I said, I had, was cut off, so I had no connections for anything. So I kind of had to figure things out on the fly. But the, these are fun modes to use. I got up early in the morning a couple of times during the cruise to shoot the sunrise. And one of the things about this camera is it's very good at ISO 100. If you start creeping up to ISO 500, 6, 7, over 1,000, and you do long exposures, there's going to be a ton of noise in the darker parts of the image. What I would say is if you're going to do long exposures, you're better off opening the shutter up for a longer amount of time rather than raising up your ISO to try to shorten your exposure time because what's gonna happen is you're gonna end up with a lot of noise in the images. So all of these images that I shot, they're all at ISO 100. Some of them are HDR, some of them are single shots, but they're all really, really, really clean. And when the first set of shots I showed you where I was at the beach, the first two or three images I took at ISO 500. And as soon as I started editing them, I could tell right away, they just looked terrible. There was noise and all, and after, and for some reason, I don't even know why I did it. I noticed that my ISO was at 500. So I dropped it back down to 100 and I was able to see the difference in my editing. The images just cleaned up really nice. And that's not a big difference, but on the smaller sensor, you see it. With a DSLR, my full frame, you're going to have more room to move around with your ISO. You're gonna be able to, you know, shoot at ISO 800 and still get pretty clean images. I wanted to talk about lenses for a second here. I took 
all of my lenses. I took my Tokina, which was a 300 and something dollar lens. I, the Tamron that I bought, the 17 to 55, which really performed well. And I liked that lens and it was only $219 used. That one was a surprise, really good lens. Um, I also had my 50 millimeter, which is $125. And I had the 22 millimeter M mount lens that I think sells for 219. The one really good lens I had with me was Eric's 70 to 200. And I'm gonna show you a bunch of images here and you're gonna see the difference that a good lens makes. Look at these images I took as we came into St. Thomas and just the depth of field you can get with them. And these landscape shots I took of another ship that was in port. Check out how sharp this shot is. I took it, this is the original, this is cropped in a little bit, and then this is cropped in all the way. So this camera with a good lens is unbelievably capable. And I would throw his lens on every now and then to get a few shots, but I really wanted to test it with the less expensive glass because I don't think everybody that's buying this camera is going to be spending $2,400 on a lens. This camera can handle really good lenses. And if you want to build up a lens collection, this camera can pretty much handle anything you throw at it with these great lenses. You're, you're going to get amazing images with this camera and really good lenses. So in St. Thomas, I actually took a few more images in the water again, and I did these with the, this was the, the uh, Tamron lens, the 17 to 55 or 50, I think it is. And these were shot at 2.8. And I also got a really great depth of field here. And I used a flash again during the day. So this is the lens that I was really testing out here. And it was great. I had no issues with it. Got some really cool images. Then even after I took some landscape shots, tried to get some shots of the trees and whatever else, but um, it performed great. Inexpensive lens, great walk around lens. It's a nice focal length. It's equal to about 24 to 70. We went into Puerto Rico next. And Puerto Rico is a great little town to, we were in old San Juan. And it's a great walk around photography town because the buildings are very vibrantly painted, a lot of old architecture, um, the streets are narrow, cobblestone, very cool place to do portraits of your friends, family, uh, just to get, you know, landscape shots. They have this cool street where they have umbrellas hanging in the street. And I took some images of that. And this whole day I walked around with the 22 millimeter M mount lens. So this is a native mount lens for the M50 and it worked wonderfully. Super, super small. I mean, the whole, Everything I had in my hand, I, I could put in my sh cargo short pocket. It was very easy to use. Got some nice images with this lens. So in Puerto Rico, though, the one thing I will tell you about this camera, you're going to want to shoot selfies with it because I, I'm looking at it right now. I can see myself. The, these lenses that like the, the one that I was using in Puerto Rico, the 22 millimeter, it's an F2 lens. So that's a great lens. It's a super shallow depth of field. Like right here, I'm shooting on a wide lens. Now this wide lens, because it's so wide, even at 2.8, I have a pretty decent depth of field. Everything's not completely blurred out behind me. But at 22 millimeters on an M mount lens, I'm looking at like, I don't know, it's like 30 something millimeters. And then the F2 creates a pretty shallow depth of field. So here's a picture of my wife and I taking a selfie. And as you can see, I'm out of focus and my wife is in focus. So you have to be really careful when you're shooting portraits of people. And this happened to me a few times, especially with the 50 millimeter lens. If you have a group of people and you focus on one of them and there's any kind of um, difference in the depth of the people. So if you have, you know, two rows of people or, you know, just something where they're not all in a line on the same focal plane, somebody's gonna be out of focus. And as you can see in that image, I'm the one out of focus. And I noticed this when I was editing some of the images. The shallow depth of field is great, but for group images, you're gonna to wanna to, um, close down your aperture and get to like F4, 5.6, or even F8. This way you make sure everybody's in focus. I wanted to talk about the dynamic range in the camera. So dynamic range is basically how much information your camera captures and how much of that you can get back in editing. So once you're comfortable with the camera and you start to use it more, you'll understand when you're shooting what you can and can't do. There are situations where 
maybe you don't have a flash or maybe the pop-up flash on your camera is not good enough or you're you're just in a situation where you're not going to be able to get what you need in that shot. But if you know that your camera is capable of recovering the shadows and, and bringing down the highlights, it, it gives you a lot of leeway to then go into the computer and fix it. So the M50 does not have the dynamic range that a full frame DSLR has. It's not that it's bad, but it's not what I'm used to. So if you're coming from a full frame camera and you're going to buy this as a second camera or as a travel camera, you're going to be a little disappointed with the dynamic range. You're going to want to use HDRs for your long exposures. You're not going to be able to adjust it as much as you could with a full frame camera. If you don't know what I'm talking about or you're not really sure how to use this, here's an example of an image I took. We were walking back to the ship and again, I took a selfie with the camera. I put it down low and I took a shot. Now the sky above me is completely blown out. And my wife and I are dark. I was able to save this image because of the dynamic range that the camera captured. And this is pretty good, even you know for this sensor here, this crop sensor. Now my full frame camera would actually let me recover more of the highlights in the background and then open up the shadows even more. But there were a few instances where I just couldn't save it, you know, where it just there just wasn't enough information in there. So this is something that you will, as you use these cameras more, you become more aware of and you may come to rely on, which I have over the years of using a full frame DSLR. I know situations where I'm going to be okay, even though with, in the camera, it looks terrible. I know I'll be able to fix it. With this camera, I wasn't sure. And there were a few images that were not recoverable because it can't do what my DSLR could. By the way, I'm noticing these raccoon eyes I have. Uh, you know, seven days with sunglasses on. Well, I guess it is what it is. Yeah, beautiful weather. Back to New York, 25 degrees today. Oh, it's terrible. So at the end of this video, I'm just going to throw up some images of maybe some friends that we were with or just some scenes from around the ship or whatever it is. But I want to give you a general view of what the camera is capable of. And like I said, most of the images here are with not super expensive glass. You know, the most expensive lens I have here is under $400 that I took the bulk of these images with. And I'm not going to put any of the images I took with the 70 to 200 at the end. So you'll see that all of these images with this camera, it's, it's under $1,000 for this combination, which is pretty good. And it's a great walk around camera. And it was really very convenient to have. And I could take it with me to dinner and just put it on the table and it was it was a it was a great travel camera. The last thing I want to talk about is the screen and the electronic viewfinder. I use a DSLR. I'm comfortable looking through a viewfinder. I did not use the viewfinder on this camera at all this entire trip. I found myself using the touch screen on the back. It's intuitive. It's responsive. I love the touch to focus functions on here. I love the edge to edge focus. I found that when I put the camera up to my face, um, because I have a you know sizable nose, my nose would actually touch the screen and it would move the focus point around on the screen. So it was very hard for me to do that. I'd be moving the focus point with my thumb and then my nose would touch the screen and move it around. So it was crazy. But uh, even if you don't have a giant nose like me, uh, it's, it's just easier to use the camera away from your face. And it's a, it's a great, great interface that Canon has on the back of this camera. I love it. I love being able to quickly change my functions and move around through the settings. And even though the camera doesn't have as many physical buttons as a DSLR, everything you need is right there on the back of the screen. So it was a very pleasant shooting experience. And I'm curious when I go back to using my DSLR, how I'm going to feel about that. So that wraps it up. The one other thing with the Canon M50 that we were thinking about doing a video and you let us know what you feel is actually setting up a studio situation with um, strobes and soft boxes and shooting portraits and seeing how the camera performs in that situation where it's super controlled and you know, are they going to be as sharp as say with 
Eric's 5D Mark IV. We can, you know, shoot them right next to each other and see what kind of images we can get with that. So that might be one more that we do with the Canon M50 because uh, you guys really seem to be interested in this camera and it's, uh, it's a popular camera right now and I can understand why. You're getting a lot of bang for your buck with this thing. So if you have any questions, ask them in the comments. Uh, if you like the video, give it a thumbs up. And if you're just stumbling upon us and you like these kind of uh, content, you know, subscribe to the channel and click the little bell, you'll get notified. And if you're looking for Canon M50 information, and this is the first video you've seen by us, we did a few other ones and I'll link them up here. And just go back over the last month. There's a there's quite a few videos about this camera. So if you want to know about it, you know, look back through those uh, because we've been really trying to test it out in every situation. Okay, see you in the next one.